you for joining our Sign World Public webinar today. My name is Jeannie Borum and I am part of the Sign World corporate team and I will be the moderator for our session today. For those of you who may not have joined one of these live previously or watch one of our recorded sessions, I'll just give you a very quick overview of what to expect for our time together as far as our format. Uh, first off, we'll be going around and doing introductions of our owners who are on our panel today that will be answering your questions. They'll give a brief overview of their business, uh, where they're located, their staff, biggest customers, their background, et cetera. And then uh, the fun begins where we're gonna start going to our participants and we're gonna ask you to uh, introduce yourself, share where you're located, and then um, go with one question at a time. We do ask you to keep it to one single question each time. If time permits, we'll go around for a second uh, offer for additional questions. Um, again, if time permits, so uh, just please do keep it to one in the beginning. So with that said, uh, first and foremost, let's go ahead and introduce to you our owners who are on our panel today. Um, I'm going to go by newest as a number of years in the business. Um, and I believe Kelly, that would be you first. So if you can go ahead and introduce yourself, that'd be great. Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Kelly from uh, the Milwaukee Sign Company. And uh, we have the, you know, kind of the, the Milwaukee metro area. Uh, we kind of go from the lake all the way to uh, almost up to Madison and then south down to almost the line and up to about West Bend in our area. Sorry. Um, so as, as Jean said, I'm probably the youngest here. So we've been in our, our space here. Uh, it was two years in June, which had another six or about 30 months in our space. So I'm, I'm between two and three years um, as an owner. Um, we've got a facility that's uh, about 3,200, a little over 3,200 square feet. We have, um, and we've got uh, uh, maybe a third of that is shop and and then two thirds is the uh, is office. Um, so it, it's kind of the space that we ended up with. Uh, it took us a while to get it, but we like where we are. We're pretty happy. We are sitting at four employees right now. Uh, we've got a, a, someone who exclusively does project management, someone doing uh, production management, and then uh, someone who does pr uh, production and installation for us. Our projections for uh, 2023, uh, we, we will be end up somewhere between 1.2 and 1.3 million. Um, our biggest customer is a uh, linen care uh, uh, a supplier, uh, and it's it's probably about $250,000 for that customer all in, and it continues to give back. It's a national account for us, uh, one that we work really hard and um, even stay on top of because it reaps great benefits for us. Before doing this, I was an, I was an engineer for 25 years or so, um, electrical engineering and um, actually developed um, spect photometers at, at at one point in my career, most recently, uh, which kind of lend, lend, lends itself nicely to understanding color in the in the sign industry. So that's me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly. Appreciate you joining us today. Um, let's go for the next owner who has just a little bit more length uh, in time in his business. Uh, Dick, if you can give us an introduction for yourself today. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dick Cassidy, and I'm the owner of Image 212. Um, based uh, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, opened our doors on February 1st, 2020, and um, ended up uh, selling the business here most, more re very recently in uh, 2023. Um, at the time uh, I sold the business, we were doing $2.1 million. Um, still in contact with the, uh, the owner that bought the business, and uh, I think the projections for 2023 are to be hit about... Uh, 2.5 million dollars so their business continues to grow um, had seven employees when we sold I think they're up to eight employees now and the largest customer that we had um, at the time that I sold was about four hundred thousand dollars and that was a company called uh, Amazon um, <laughs> we were doing business in 45 states um, out of uh, a single location so that's uh, a quick update and what was your background before you joined Sign World, oh, Dick? Yep, thanks. Uh, so prior to that, I had a career in medical devices where I was uh, in the commercial side of the business in executive leadership positions and medical device companies uh, from large companies, as well as I did about four or five startups in the medical device arena as well. So that's it. Very good. Very good. Thanks for joining us today. And our veteran owner, Mr. Larry Foster, please give an introduction. 
Hey, uh, my name is Larry Foster, and I'm my business uh, is located in Troy, Michigan, which is a suburb of Detroit. We're about 30 miles north of Detroit. Uh, the name of the business is Signs and More, and I've been around uh, in this business now for 23 years. Um, we are in a uh, 8,000 square foot building. It's my third location. I bought this building about 12 or 13 years ago. Um, I have 16 employees. Um, let's see, we're going to do, it's pretty easy to tell what we're going to do with 2023 since we've got about three weeks left, but mm -hmm. we'll do about $2.25 million. And our, my biggest customer is a company called Dark Properties. And if you think of Dark uh, Solo Cups, they that is the manufacturer of Solo Cups. Well, they also own a lot of apartment complexes. And so we are, uh, we spend a lot of our time redoing their apartment com complexes in the, in our market. Uh, and my background uh, was in retail. I worked for Kmart for 27 years. And when I left there about 24 years ago, I was the vice president of operations for the company. Very good. Thank you, Larry. I remember the blue light special very fondly uh, at yes. Kmart. <laughs> very good. Jack, if you could give an introduction. Hey everybody, I'm Jack Warner. I joined Seinwald in 1995 as a uh, Seinwald operation. Back then, we were a little different. We were a, a retail space uh, uh, without a digital printer, or strictly cut vinyl, and we used the yellow pages. So we've changed a lot over the years. Uh, I started in 1,100 square feet with one employee, uh, ended 10 years later at 5,000 square feet, staff of 11, doing 1.3. Uh, my largest customer was a region developer for Subway, uh, 200 locations. I did about 250000 per year with that one contact at Subway. And Subway changes every single sign every four to five years, and so it's a recurring thing. I then uh, sold my operation. I joined our founder, Ken Kent, at corporate office in kind of a partnership arrangement. Learning his end of the business, finished buying him out in 2014. I'm now the president of Steinworld. So when I answer questions today, if it goes to my experience running an operation, I'll speak from that perspective. It goes more towards the large community or training or policy. I'll speak to that perspective. Very good. Thank prior you, Jack. To, to sign world, I ran a wholesale food distribution company. Very good. Sorry for the inter interruption. All right. Very good. Let's turn it over to our guests now. And uh, again, I'll call you off by name. If you can take yourself off a of mute when I do so, tell the group where you're located and then just go ahead with your individual question that you'd like to ask the owners to address. Um, so I'm going to go uh, in order based on when you logged in. And Sandra, I believe you were the first. If you can go ahead and take yourself off a of mute, tell the group where you're from and go ahead with the question for today. Good afternoon. Um... I am located currently in San Antonio, Texas, but we are interested in relocating to the Greenville, South Carolina area. So that's really the territory that we're focused on. Mm -hmm. um, well, Greenville, Anderson, that whole triangle. Um, I guess if I had to ask one question, uh, narrow it down to what have you, at, as an owner and through the pandemic and through all of the other changes, what is the one piece of advice that you would give for employee turnover. Um, that is one of our biggest concerns is in, in any industry, we've seen a lot of issues with uh, having to, or being able to retain good employees. Um, so what is an incentive or a recommendation that you would give for being able to, to keep those good employees? Yeah, that's a really good question, Sandra. Thanks for asking that. Uh, let's go ahead to our, let's go to our veteran uh, owner first. Larry, what would you say is your suggestion to attracting and retaining key employees in your business? Well, first of all, I'd say it's it's a challenge. Um, it's uh, more difficult today than it was uh, uh, 10 years ago to attract uh, uh, talent, but um, they're out there. Uh, the good thing about starting a new company, you have the newest uh, the greatest of everything, new equipment, new software. So people in the industry love to work in that environment. So you've got a, a leg up there. Um, the other thing about this industry that's important, particularly when you talk about employees, it's very, very low turnover. As I said earlier, I, I came out of the retail world, world where it was just the opposite end of the spectrum. You were hiring all the time. In this industry, 
it's it's a very low turnover. This is a career for your employees. So it's the treatment that you um, that you have with them, the relationship, making sure that they they know they're a, an important part of the organization, and they're there and they'll stay with you. Very good. And Larry, you uh, you've been in business since the two thousand eight recession and through COVID, so you've uh, definitely had your business through a lot of those challenging times. Thanks for yeah. sharing. Yep. Dick, how about you? What was your th what's your thoughts about this uh, employee aspect? Sure. So we opened our doors literally right about a month before the uh, the pandemic hit, and um, we my first employee was with me until I sold the uh, the business. And um, the uh, so we we were pretty fortunate in terms of uh, had uh, very very little turnover. Um, and I would say that the things that were important in my mind were you know creating a culture. Uh, a culture that people wanted to be a part of, a culture that people enjoyed working and coming to work. And uh, we just tried to preserve that type of culture throughout the time. Um, and uh, so I think that's really important. I think number two is the communication. So just making sure that we're constantly communicating with, uh, with the team of people and also, you know, making sure that they know that they're appreciated um, for their efforts and the things that they do. So we tried to you know, celebrate the successes and recognize the successes, but also, you know, as we ran into, you know, uh, issues or things like that, also try to address them head on so that they recognize, and, and really in that scenario, try to focus on more of the behavior as opposed to the person. Um, so, you know, for us, it was, uh, you know, we were fortunate, we had some a really good team of people. And I think they, you know, like Larry had mentioned, um, you know, it's kind of a career focused individuals and i think by creating that culture and uh, the communication it worked out pretty well that we kept them around so very good thank you kelly your thoughts well like two and a half years in you know i do have my original staff uh here we've had to let a, a few people go uh, but i think the thing that you know makes the difference a, a you have to do your homework when you hire make sure you you know you look into that and make sure you're getting the right types of people that you know fit your culture once it's developed. And then what we tried to do is allow them, we empowered them to be part of the systems and processes that we develop, you know, when they have ownership of them, um, they seem to, they, they, they feel like they own part of the business. I mean, they're having an impact and they know what, how, what they do impacts the numbers. And, you know, we do simple things like even, even like we, we, we started something where every quarter an employee gets to pick a charity that our business supports. And we get behind that and we do things for that charity and give back to the community. And, and it feels very, the culture, it, it sets the tone for that. And people feel like they're part of something, uh, which is what most people want. Very good. Thank you, Kelly. Jack, your thoughts? You know, as they've already said, it's a career job. It's not a transient job. So you hire carefully and nurture, even though it's a tight economy for staff uh, or culture for staff, uh, they're out there. Uh, I did an interview uh, in Denver the uh, day before yesterday. I've got to do one in San Diego on Monday. Each of them are coming with 15, 20 years of experience. And they're looking for one of several things. Uh, like Larry said, they're looking for the latest and greatest of equipment. Two, they're anxious to help build a culture, not have to step into somebody else's culture. And they want to be treated well. They're the number two or three person where they currently work and they want to be the the head one. So there's there's staff out there. We'll help you find them. We'll help test them. Very good. Thank you. All right. Let's go to our next participant uh, for a question. Tyler, if you can take yourself off of mute, tell the group where you're from and go ahead with a question for today. Bet. So I have to apologize first. I have a cold, so my voice is kind of gruff. <laughs> um, but I live in southern Utah right now. And my question is, as I have looked at the first year sales numbers, there seems to be a lot of variability, um, about an $800,000 difference between the low and the high. And so my question is, what would you say are the biggest factors involved in that? Is it a matter of territorial location? Is it marketing efforts or is it something else? Great question. Uh, Kelly, let's start with you first. We'll go in reverse order. What do you feel is the keys to success and what are the contributing factors? Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, it certainly does start with, you know, getting, getting, getting the phone to ring, getting leads to come in, but it's how you respond to those. It, it, what we've learned, there's a ton of competition, I think, in any area. I think in 
the Milwaukee area, I think there are five sign world companies that are within the same territory that I'm marketing in. Um, so there's there's a lot of competition, sure, but there's a lot of business. I mean, I've never really felt uh, like I was squeezed out of anything or did, couldn't get anything that I really set my sights on. Uh, and the other thing I think is was really important for growth is 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 realizing when you start that you can tap into you have a national business because you have 340 some businesses around. And I've got I'm doing business kind of like uh, Dick was saying, I'm doing business all over the uh, country. And and that's you you have boots on the ground for surveys and installations and you can fab stuff and have it shipped all over and you can just grow as, as fast as you can. I think our biggest problem with trying to grow it is people you know just trying to keep up because you can it's growth is it's got to be it's got to be managed of course uh but uh, you know i i think that you can get to those numbers by working hard not working the other people but there's a ton of business out there there just is all across in your own area but also if you if it's slow there you just kind of look to the nation and see where you need to go yeah and interesting that this question is being asked because kelly weren't you our runner up the, of the year last year for rookie of the year if i remember correctly yeah. Yes, I was. Uh, yep. To uh, to Corbin, right? <laughs> Second right. to Corbin. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. It was a it was a nice honor. Very nice. Very, very good. And we do have a rookie of the year on the panel today. Uh, DeCassi, let's have you go next. Sure. So in Dallas, there were, were are about 450 sign and graphic companies in Dallas. So it's definitely not a um, there's a definitely a ton of competition. But I would say when you look at across the group of owners, you know, everyone comes with a different background and a different goals and different objectives. Um, some people enter into this as in more of a, um, they hate, they're going to kind of tailor off their uh, current career path and they just want to do more of a relaxed approach to the business. And they kind of approach the business in that fashion. Others probably come into the business with an obsession that they want to grow a business as fast as they possibly can and make it as big as they possibly can as quickly as they possibly can. So the kind of initial goal for each of the owners is different. Um, I would say for the people that I've seen that have grown their business rapidly, I would say, number one, they're extremely opportunistic. They say yes to everything and they hustle and they chase down orders and they chase down business with an obsession. Um, I would say that um, they also have a tendency to invest more money into the marketing side of the business, um, a little bit more there because they recognize that as an opportunity to, you know, increase their business and grow their business and instead of saving their way to success. So they may spend a little bit more money on the front end investing to try to get the, their, their business up and running more quickly. Um, and then I would say the last thing is probably focusing on the basics and executing the basics. Sign World provides a great um, structure and a great foundation of this is what we know works. This is what we know can help you to be successful. And I think executing on those basic fundamentals is, is very, very important. So it's not about necessarily doing anything out outrageous and out lavish. It's about focusing on the fundamentals and executing those with a high amount of, of uh, you know, enthusiasm and a high degree of, you know, focus. Um, and I think that to me would be the biggest difference from, you know, all the various owners, one, one to the other. Very good. Thank you, Dick. Larry, been quite a bit of time since you first started, but what do you think are the keys to success to having a strong first year? I was the rookie of the year also. Hey, I, I, did, I didn't know that. So that's good that's to know. Congratulations. I was uh, in fact then. <laughs> um, I, I, the question is is correct. There are some wide differences in, in sales variations between one unit and another. And I agree with Dick. It's really the personality of the owner. It's uh, what do they want? What are they striving for? Um, the aggressiveness that they show. But there's some real basics that whether you're aggressive or whether you're passive, you've got to do. And when you get started, you're probably going to do some networking. And there's people that don't want to do that. They, uh, they're not interested in doing networking, but that's out there to help you get started. Um, and how quickly you get your website up and, and get your presence online. When I started, there wasn't an online presence, so it was all networking. But uh, the your your Website is so critical to your business. It's uh, 
you know, I can't stress it enough how, how much of your business will come from your website. So that's important and makes a difference in, in uh, a slow start and a fast start. Very good. Jack, any additional thoughts there? Uh, just real quick. Uh, you know, while the internet's going to drive the great majority of the business, unless you throw extra money into pay-per-click ads, you have to do some of that networking, not as a permanent endeavor, but until it, the network, the internet does kick in. I think the other two things that drive it early, it's having a swagger, a confidence. Uh, as Dick says, say yes and figure out how to do it. And it's not necessarily a, a, a noisy, wild swagger. Some of our most successful signers are very quiet and humble, but yet they, they carry a, a sense of confidence. I can take care of you. The customer needs that. They, they need to believe in you. And the other is you can only handle so much volume with so much staff. And I think some sign will learners try and keep it so lean, trying to run as far as they can with one or two people rather than saying, I need a few more people in here to handle it because otherwise they get stuck in the minutia. They're working in the business, not working on the business. Yeah. All great thoughts. Thank you, Jack. All right, let's go to our next participant, Steve. If you can take yourself off of mute, tell the group where you're from and go ahead with a question. Steve Hawker, maybe I should say your last name just so you know that you're the Steve. Yes, there you go. I think you're still on mute on your side. Give you another moment here. All right, Steve, if you're not able to ask a question, if you want to put it into the chat box, I'll come back to it here in a, in a few moments, but we'll move on to our next guest in the meantime. Uh, Sha uh, Josh, if you can take yourself off of mute, tell the group where you're from and go ahead with a question. Oh, you were on muted and then you went back on mute. Hopefully we're not having web access issues here. All right, Josh, I'm gonna go past you again, put it in the chat box if you need to, otherwise I'll come back in a moment. Uh, Joe, if you can take yourself off of mute. Hi, I'm Joe from uh, <clears throat> Mouse from Wilmington. It's between Cincinnati and Columbus in Ohio. And my question, I guess, was you talked about a, a lot of it already, which was how to you know, what was the best way to market the company? But what about the website is really the most critical part about um, making that presence known? What's what what works on the website? What doesn't? I guess everybody's saying that it's kind of like critical for success. What about what makes a successful website? I guess what I'm asking. Yeah, great question. Uh, Larry, let's start with you. You started in the days of yellow pages, but having a business today, what's key about the website? Well, as I said, I think it's probably one of the most critical pieces of, of jump jump starting your business. But you know, the thing with the website, you, you know, there's an appearance. It's got to have. Um, you got to have a, a availability for mobile um, usage. Um, the, the it's got to be fresh. You've got to you've got to keep it up to date and fresh. And having new things on your website, there should be blogs on there. Um, so I think that's uh, very important. And then you know, just not that we do that in house. We have somebody that actually does work on our website. But it's got to be easy to use. You get into a website, and if it's difficult to use, people are going to drop off. And so you've got to have uh, just a good background in that in your website. Larry, how much do you spend a month on your marketing uh, for your website? Not a lot. We we spend probably I don't know, less than two thousand dollars. Okay, very good. Thank you, Kelly. What are your thoughts about the website? Um, I would agree that you definitely want to keep it current and contemporary with the jobs that you've most recently done. And if you're using stock photos, get those out as soon as possible and get your own work in there because that's really important. Um, and, and the thing that we do, you know, it's important is to understand the data that you're, you're seeing from your website to where are those leads coming from. You know, if you can get to a point where you have the, you know, the client acquisition cost as a percentage of sales, understanding how you're spending that money, what's effective and what's not is really important. Uh, for us, we're, we're probably at, we, we, we actually have two sites, two websites, two domains, and we, uh, I think we're probably in for, um, uh, maybe, uh, $3,200, $3,300 a month right now in our, in our, our total costs for lead generation. How many leads per month are you getting from that investment, Kelly? 
uh, we are getting, I would say, uh, 42 to 47 a month. Mm -hmm. So we're getting a decent return on our investment. Very good. Thank you. Dick, what are your thoughts? Uh, first thing I would say, uh, and I think Larry may have mentioned this early on, is, is get your website up early, right? Because it takes usually a couple of months to get uh, some traction with the website. But once you start getting traction, it just it's, it's a building uh, it continues to build. So that's uh, number one is number two is work with your partners. So we have SignWorld has a handful of preferred partners for web marketing and lead generation and uh, search engine optimization. And I think working with that partner in, in the design of your website, as well as the ongoing effectiveness of your website is, is critical. Uh, three, I would say is reviews. Get Google reviews. The more Google reviews that you can get and get your customers to post, that helps to bolster more traffic to your website. And it also gives a favorable impression to the people looking at your website. So be obsessed with getting Google reviews and Google five-star reviews from your customers. Um, investment. I'm a big believer. I, I actually spent a $5,000 a month on, uh, and we had two different websites. Um, well, actually, technically, probably three different websites, but, um, and we spent more than the average person, um, but it yielded the results. And so to me, it wasn't an expense, it was an investment. So we were, uh, when I sold the business, we were generating 250 leads a month on a $5,000 investment. So, uh, and then the last thing is, 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 rate your leads so when you get a lead that comes into your website and it's something that is desirable then understand what it is about that lead that makes it desirable and work with your web partner to get them to replicate that and say we want more of these types of leads so they can then put into the algorithm to generate more leads like that which will bolster your overall uh, impact and overall revenue that you generate with your company all right thank you Doug. jack your thoughts you know, I agree with all that they say to add to what Dick was saying. Well, you have a lot of leads coming in doesn't mean you necessarily need to chase or want all those leads. Prioritize which ones you want to put more effort into. And then be different than the competition. Learn to ask the questions that are really needed. Get them to understand and believe in you before you're just giving them a price. And then it's proper follow-up. Uh, you know, how many times have you put somebody out on a, on a website requesting information and just not gotten what you need back? So making sure that you give that customer uh, the experience that they're expecting and they want to do business with you. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, perfect. Well, Steve uh, did put a question in the chat box. He doesn't have audio on his PC today. So I believe we've addressed this, but let's just uh, make sure we have. The question is to wonder what is the appropriate amount of budget uh, to promote the local advertising and marketing as you're ramping up the new business? Um, so Larry, you said today you're spending about 2000. Is that correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Kelly, uh, what, what, what amount did you say you're spending? 2,500. I hear that correct. No, we're, we have two sites. So we're about 32, I think 3250. 32. Okay. Very good. Dick, you said 5,000 was, uh, your investment in marketing. Yeah. 5,200 all in because we had a social media, uh, company that we partnered with as well for 200. So 5,200 was our investment there. Okay, very good. Uh, Jack, that's a wide variety. What would you say is the overall average? Sign will recommend it is 2,500. Uh, those that want to push the business more or do less of the networking and want to do more from the internet, probably in the low threes, but 2,500 is a normal number. Good. I know our early year survey average for marketing expenses was right at 2,200 nationwide. So uh, those are some good numbers for those of you listening to the call to expect to want to dedicate minimally to your marketing budget based on what you've heard, heard here. So Steve, thanks for uh, putting that question in there. Uh, let's go to our next guest. Um, let's see, Joe, I'm not sure if you're able to uh, come off of mute now. I think I tried once before. Let's give you one more time. That was Josh, actually, I think you were looking for Oh, I'm sorry. Well, let's go to Joe next. No, it was, I am Joe. Oh, I wrote down the wrong person with the wrong question. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to keep track here and make sure I get everybody a chance. Josh, if you could take yourself off of mute, if you're able to. There we go. Uh, this is Josh Doro, uh, Seattle, Washington area. Sorry, I was having trouble with the audio earlier. Um, so my question is whether, uh, you know, there's a lot of major accounts that you guys mentioned you're working with, whether it's the linen company, Amazon, or dark manufacturing. How do you guys go about finding these big major accounts that account for a large portion of your revenue? 
Yeah, great question. I'm actually going to add that because some of them are talking about these major accounts and supporting them in other markets besides where they're located. So let's talk about not only getting those major accounts, but then how do you support them when they're not in your local geography? Um, Dick, you talked about Amazon being one of your bigger accounts. How did you get that customer and how did you support them? So the um, I would say 98% of our leads came from our uh, our website. So the way that um, I found Amazon is they found me. Uh, via my website. And normally on Saturday mornings, I, I sleep in on Saturday mornings, but for some strange reason, I happened to be up and my phone rang on a Saturday morning. And uh, it was this company that had an interest in a very peculiar sign. It was an odd shape and it was a sp very, very specific color and they needed it on Monday morning. And uh, I said, uh, no problem. We'll take care of it. I got all the information, got it. Had absolutely no idea how I was going to do this. Called a friend of mine that uh, I had met during the, my discovery process and uh, told him what I needed. He helped produce the sign for me, got it for my customer. That was a tryout to get um, um, an opportunity to, to get my first order out of Amazon. So um, that came in through the, the website. We also got other big giant customers out of the website, uh, General Motors, American Airlines, uh, Chick-fil-A, um, the largest uh, commercial developer in the Dallas Fort Worth metropolitan area, uh, Target stores, Lily Pulitzer, um, Chewy's, um, are just some of the companies that we were able to uh, get through our website. So um, that would be the primary thing. And then, and then the biggest thing is, is when those opportunities come in, take advantage of them and 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 partner and listen and deliver what they're looking for because they just they just want somebody to help them. And they want somebody that knows what they're doing to help them. And that's that's the key in my mind. Very good. And Dick, when you closed your business uh, or sold your business, how many states were you doing business in? 45. Yep, 45 states. So Very good. Very good. Kelly, let's go to you next. You mentioned about having your large customer. Talk a little bit about how you acquired them and how you support them. Yep. So the the uh, <clears throat> the company that I was talking about, the linen company, actually came from Cudahy, Wisconsin. And they found us through our website initially. But it was more like the response and, and the in the rapidness and the quality of service that we gave once we realized the opportunity that was there that really led to it uh, growing. And it became then really a series of referrals from other people within the, the linen industry to other states that just kept it growing and say, yeah, if you want a sign done, people are people are going to ask for a, a sign to be done in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in Batavia, New York, because they trust the people. I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of people can turn out good signs and they're a commodity. It's about the experience they have and knowing that you're taking something off their plate, that's probably a headache for them as they're trying to get, multi, as they're acquiring businesses and locations and trying to get signage through them. It's a major, major, you know, a distraction in what they probably do for a day, on their day, in their day job. So it's really the series of referrals within the business once you get the lead. We have gotten other leads as well. Um, through that we LinkedIn is a good source. I mean, I one of the biggest ones I got was from a, a buddy I used to work with, whose sister in law is the director of signage for freighted hospitals in the area. Well, I, I reached out and I said, Hey, you know anybody that you know is looking for signs? I have a business, and you know he just said, Yeah, talk to my sister in law, and it happens, and that business generates a hundred thousand dollars a year for us. And, and hospitals like a lot of things; they just keep churning signs all the time. It just never really ends. So those are great. And again, that's referral who also then referred us to a, a charitable organization that she used to work with. And it just goes on and on. It's about delivering excellence. And then it just takes care of itself. People want to refer good people and because they, you know, they're going to refer those good people to their friends and, and uh, colleagues. So it kind of works out well for us. And I think we're in, I think we're in 11 states, nowhere near 45, but you know, that's, that's good for us. And we feel pretty proud of that. 11 states is a, is a pretty good footprint for us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. Larry, how about you? Well, we've got, you know, we do business with all kinds of big companies, um, you know, be, being from the Detroit area, General Motors, uh, Ford, uh, Dana, Magna, all of the automotive suppliers that, that we do, but we do them with Dunkin' Donuts. We do many, but the, and we get those, by the way, our, our website and referrals or someone who used to work at this location now has relocated to a different job and uh, you know they know us from a previous one so there's a lot of that as well um, 
But the truth for me, a lot of my business, the majority of my business comes from more mid-sized companies, not the big ones. You know, the, we love doing business with the big ones. I, you know, I always, always like to say the the further from your own pocket with your money, the better off you are. It's, uh, you know, if you don't have to worry about where that money's coming from, you just got a budget to spend. Um, those are those are nice customers, but mine are more of a mid-size customer that we have. That's the majority of my business. And Larry, how do you support customers outside of the Detroit market if you have a project in a different area? Well, there's, I mean, we do we ship out uh, nationwide every day. We, you know, I have people that are boxing and shipping um, because our our clients are located in multiple locations. Um, but the ones that are a little more difficult are the ones where you have installations and bigger projects. And then I, I always try to work with uh, my fellow sign world owners around the country. We have a owner's website. I know where everybody's located. I can pinpoint the closest sign worlds to me. I know all about their experience and they're extremely helpful getting things done in other states. And I'm sure they're using you there in Michigan as well. I, I get used a lot. <laughs> Very good. Jack, your thoughts? Uh, before I answer, I'm going to start a couple of slideshows that go on in the background. No audio to them. We'll continue having questions. The first slideshow shows some of the operations inside and out, so you can see what operations look like. Second one goes to what is a sign, not only what can we produce in-house with the original equipment, as well as a section showing what we can, what we need to outsource until we bring in that equipment. And then a uh, last part of that slideshow shows some unusual things you wouldn't even think of as a sign. The third, third slideshow goes to our wall of fame, showing some of the bigger projects and customers that have done. And I'll have those going while we're continuing to have conversation. You know, most projects come from a middle manager at a corporate office trying to do research as we all do on the internet. And sometimes it starts off with something small. They're just testing the water, seeing if we can do it. But because we have a more professional uh, approach than most of our competition, we're able to get customers like this. And, and then let's see, no customer is a dead end. Every customer has a connection to somebody else. So it's leveraging the relationships and the, the uh, reputation we built to get to other contacts they have or other departments from that same company. Very good. Thank you, Jack. All right, let's go to our next guest while the slideshow starts. Uh, Greg, if you can go ahead and take yourself off of mute. It looks like you already are. Go ahead with a question. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Greg Meyer. Uh, my territory would be the North Shore of Massachusetts, which uh, is encompassed by, uh, I'd say, 25, 30 miles, maybe a bit more north of Boston. Um, I think my question is maybe for Dick specifically, because there's people that have started their business and then there's some veterans on the phone. But Dick, what had you get in and out so quickly? Yeah, um, the primary reason is that's, that was my goal, right? I, I had a goal that I wanted, I'd, I'd done probably four or five startups in the med, my medical device career. And um, it was always using somebody else's money, but usually venture capital money, uh, private equity money. And I always, you know, I guess I had a desire to start my own business, build it and sell it uh, on my own. So it wasn't so much a financially driven reason. It was more of a personal um, thing that I wanted to do. Um, and so I, after doing my research, I researched the science graphics industry pretty extensively, probably uh, researched it for six or seven months uh, before I actually decided to, to pull the trigger. And as I, through that discovery process, uh, you know, it's it longer than most, right? But um, what I learned was, is that, you know, if I could build a $2 million business and sell it, it'd be a valuable thing. It'd be something that'd be very attractive to, to people. Um, and, um, and I felt that was going to take me about five years to do that. Um, having gone through it and then we did it, ended up doing it in three. It was just, that was my original plan. It just happened sooner and faster than I had uh, originally expected. And for those who aren't on the call today, Dick, maybe you can share what you're doing today as in your new role. <laughs> yeah. So now I teach a sales and marketing class for this uh, company called Sign World. <laughs> and I, I uh, meet with all of our new owners on uh 
on a weekly basis and, and talk to them about sales and marketing and uh, share the, with them um, ideas and suggestions on how they can get their business off the ground. Uh, in addition to that, I, I more recently joined Jeannie and her team on the business development side and helping uh, and con communicating with new prospective owners like uh, everybody that's on the phone today. So um, here to try to help um, as people navigate this, uh, this discovery process. Perfect. Thank you, Dick. Kelly, what's your exit plan? How long do you plan to own the business? What's your thoughts on that? That's a great question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure. I don't know that I necessarily have an, an exit plan. I'm probably going to, I, I do for those that know, my son is actually in the business with me. So part of the, my decision is kind of, you know, his decision as well. You know, if he wants to continue on with the business and keep uh, running the business, he enjoys it right now. Um, I, I don't, I plan on at least doing this for, you know, you know, five to five to seven years and, and probably trying to expand it though into other territories um, to, uh, you know, kind of increase my, my footprint a little bit and, and get some synergies of, you know, being able to have a fabrication center that services multiple locations. Very good. And we're going to flip the script here. We got Larry, 22 years in the business. Why are you still doing it for 22 years? What's keeping you around for so long? Well, first of all, I, I will tell you, it's a fun business. I, I really do enjoy it. And, and uh, you know, I could very easily retire. I am uh, financially, I'm ready. Uh, so all of that. Um, but I am now starting to back out of the business. My son is in the business. He will be taking it over. Um, I own the building. And uh, so therefore, even though when he takes over the business, he's still going to be renting from me. So I will be having a continued income stream uh, from the business on the real estate side, plus a continual payment that he's going to make to me for the business. But um, I, I got to tell you, it's hard for me to back out of it because you know I've got a pretty good life. I get a lot of vacation. I, I take a lot of time during the week and play golf and do a lot of the things that I enjoy. Um, and this just I like to stay in the business, but uh, it's probably time and I, I need to give him some some room to grow. Well, we're going to be sad the day that you decide it is time, but uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts there. Jack, how about you? What's your thoughts on exit strategy and just uh, the overall perspective? You know, there? Honestly, most people go into business and say, I'll worry about it later, but we really believe it's an important step. It's our very first topic in new owner training. How do we set this up so when we are ready to sell, we sell it for multiple uh, and doing that. So a lot of steps that we try and teach so that you can have a successful exit of the business. Jack, what would you say is the average length of time uh, owners own the business within Sign World? With our starting average age at 52, our average uh, exit is at 65. So 13 years is the average. We have what we call a career club of owners who've been with us for 20 years and more. Larry's one of those career club members. I think we have over 50 members now that have gotten to that 20 year point, which is very different from the franchise world where they bore out after a number of years. Uh, as Larry says, it's still fun and interesting. So we, we keep people longer. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. All great perspectives. Thanks for sharing. All right, let's go to our next guest. John, if you can take yourself off the mute, tell the group where you're from today and go ahead with a question. John, are you able to unmute yourself? All right, we'll come back to John. I'm not quite sure the first name here. Let me just double check if it's, I got a KHL Nyack, I believe. Meet yourself. All right. Well, if KHL Nyack or John, if you have a question, you want to put it into the q and I'll keep a look for that. Um, for our other guests that we've already asked, if you have a second question, now is the time to raise your hand and we can offer you an opportunity to do so. So Sandra, Steve, Tyler, Joe, Josh. Go ahead, Tyler. First off, I got to say, I forgot to mention to Larry that I my first job was actually at Kmart stocking shelves. So we have a connection there. Um, my question, though, is regarding margins. So I'm curious how margins have changed from when you started and when they stabilized. Great question. 
Uh, let's go ahead and start with Kelly first. Kelly, what would you say your margins are in the business today? And has that changed over the last several years? Well, yeah, not a lot of runtime. Yeah, it certainly has because as when you start your business, you're, you're taking jobs just to get your name out there and you're not taking the margins you would take today. We'd probably pass on some of the work we we took back then just to you know, get our get our systems you know, fleshed out and get our name out there. So we definitely wanted to do that. I'd say our margins now, I mean, most all of them are above, you know, 50% gross margin. And at the end of the day, we're having, you know, somewhere between, you know, 17 and 19% stick to our fingers um, when all is said and done. Some orders are better than others. Some are ridiculously profitable and others, you know, they're not, they're not as, as good as that. Um, but we try to have a balance and, you know, we have a you know, we have bridges that we use on a weekly basis to make sure that we're hitting those numbers and and our employees are you know incentivized to to hit numbers with with a margin because you don't want to just you know affect the top line with with bad orders right so you got to somehow pull margin into it so you know our incentives are based on not only the top line but also the, uh, the margins that we uh, generate as a result of good smart business decisions very good dick your thoughts on gross and profit margins yeah, so I'd break that down into a couple areas. So if you're doing work in-house, it's a much more profitable um, than it is if you're doing it out of house. So in-house projects usually range between 70 and 80% gross margin, whereas the out of house uh, work that we would subcontract out would be somewhere in the 40 to 60% uh, gross margins. In terms of overall net operating profit, so year one that you know obviously you're you're getting up to speed so that usually starts off pretty slow year two starts to build and again it kind of comes down to what the person's goal is in terms of how high those net, that net operating profit gets you know the goal has always been to get to 25 percent net operating profit but if you're investing back into the business expanding your space to get to a higher revenue target then those net operating margins are probably going to be a little bit lower. So we moved three times in three years. So that had an impact. Uh, I shouldn't say we moved. We moved once in three years, but we had three different um, additional spaces. So we continued to invest more to expand our business. So as we did that, it you know you're playing a little bit of catch up on the overall net operating margins that you take in. But again, our goal was a little different. Uh, in the short term, because we wanted to hit to that get to that two million dollar mark as fast as we could. So, um, year two margins were better than than year three margins because we just invested in and doubled the size of our of our business from year two to year three. So they they retracted a little bit, but now this year in year four they're recuperating that margin and and they'll be uh, back on track to get to that twenty five percent. Um, but we were high double digits at uh, net operating profit. Um, okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Larry, your thoughts on margins? Uh, well, I would say industry-wide, I can tell you in the last 23 years, I don't think they've changed much. They haven't gone up, they haven't gone down as an industry. As an individual owner, mine have fluctuated. When you start off, your margins are lower. Um, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, you're not as efficient as you are when you've been around for a while. Um, every job you have to buy all new substrates and material to do the jobs. And then as you get older, you, you're, you've been around a while, you've got, you, you have uh, material left over from other jobs that you're able to use. So you're much more e efficient that way. Um, and also the type of business that you go after will affect those margins as well. Um, if you're, as uh, was said previously, the stuff that you can do in-house is uh, your margins are really going to be up much higher. And in my particular case, we do about 90% of the business that we do is done in-house. So we we take advantage of that. And, and I, I get a gross margin of 74%. I get a uh, uh, an expense line of about 49%, and I end up at about 24, 25% net profit, so. I think it also depends too on those repeat customers. Wouldn't you agree, Larry, that when you start having repeat customers, they're not really asking for a quote, they're just asking, they're put, placing an order. So Absolutely. does that affect your, what, what's your percent of your repeat customers today, Larry? Uh, repeat customers probably, 
85, 90% of my business is repeat business. Yeah. Dick, how about you? Did you repeat customers where they hire pro more, pro more profitable as well? Um, I would say that it, it varied. We had, it, it depended on that repeat customer. Some of them were, you know, our margins were a little tighter because we were, the volume was quite a bit higher, but some of our repeat customers, the margins were very good. And again, I would say none of them were super price, uh, like super price sensitive. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. How about so, you, Kelly? Would you think that the repeat customer tends to be a more profitable customer as well? Generally, yes. I, I would kind of agree. It does vary, but you know, they once you've established the trust, they're 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 willing to pay a premium, and just again to have a smooth experience and and, and they, you know, no adventure. I just want my sign. I need it here. I want it like you did, and they're willing to do that. So I find that you can actually, you know, over time with some of the customers, you can you can increase the prices because of the trust. Absolutely. Jack, any thoughts on this question, the margins? You know, it's going to be lower in the beginning because you've got fixed overhead that has to be contributed with a smaller amount of sales. But as you grow larger, the blue sky gets to be bigger. It is a 25% industry. Uh, we've got owners that are over 30% running lean. Uh, they don't take on the jobs that are going to be smaller margins. So it, it becomes somewhat in the owners, as Dick said, your aggressiveness to get to a certain number or your willingness to charge what the, what the market will bear. Very good, thank you for that. Um, we do have time for a few more questions. So if anyone wants to raise their hand, otherwise I know we had a few who weren't able to the first time, John and KHL Nyack. Go ahead, Greg, I see your hand raised. Yeah, I, uh, my reality may be that to get this off the ground, I'm balancing it with, you know, the previous, the the work I get at my current uh, source of income. Is that even possible? Uh, or do you really have to be all in from day one, knowing that, you know, you're not going to be able to contribute, uh, you know, the kind of household income you're used to getting for a couple of years? Very good. Well, everyone left a job to become an active owner in the sign world uh, business. Uh, Kelly, are you back to your corporate level of income today? And if not, when do you anticipate being so? What's your thoughts on that question? Uh, so that's a great question. You know, you know, the first year is a little bit lean, of course, because you're, you're investing in you know, you don't, you don't have the jobs, you're trying to figure it out. But yeah, I will say again, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a good solid, you know, 30 months in, and this year, you know, with any luck at all, I will make, I will, I will, more will stick to my fingers in this business than ever has in 25 years of corporate. Um, so three years in, yeah, it's definitely possible. You work hard, it's not easy, but it, it can be done. Take your thoughts. Um, yeah, I think it comes down to, I mean, there's definitely opportunity to make as, as you know, like Jack had mentioned, you know, the 25% of your net operating profit of whatever revenue that you, that you end up generating. And I think it really comes down to what's most important for each individual owner. And that income level, you know, is, is going to be dependent on each, each person. So, and it's kind of, and I think that's the good thing about the model of sign world is you have the ability to influence that in all aspects. Um, so for me, it was never really about the money per se. Um, so I didn't really spend a whole lot of time focusing on that. I just made sure that there was more money in my bank account at the end of every month than there was the month before. That's kind of the way I, I, I had a very simple uh, look at it and then, you know, um, making sure I was making money. So not losing it as I went through it. Okay. Larry, how about you? When you first started and you're trying to replace your former career, what's your thoughts on the income side? When I started, it was definitely less. Uh, when I was uh, with Kmart, I was a corporate officer. So I had uh, I, my salary was up there. But uh, uh, fortunately, I have surpassed that. And uh, yeah, I would not go back to corporate life ever, ever again after I switched. Very good. Jack, you want to share your thoughts, not only on the income side, but also the fact that you're building an asset and equity and how that correlates? Uh, this is not a get rich quick scheme. If it is, or there, I don't think there are any good get rich quick 
get rich quick schemes out there that are effective. So you, it does take a couple of years to get back to corporate income, which means a couple of things. You can live a little bit leaner. You overfund the business to pay yourself a salary to keep your lifestyle funded during that time. Only willing to do that because once you pass the valley, now you're making more, uh, making up for what you didn't make. And the business is also building resale values. So when you sell it, you've got a big nest egg on, on the resale side of it. Do we have a few Steinroll owners that have uh, kept a side gig along with this? Uh, yes, it depends on how flexible that schedule is, how much time that takes from you and what you're expecting out of the business because it's going to re result in a slower ramp up of the business itself. Uh, virtually everybody in Seinwald has walked away from a corporate income and typically a higher income and said, this is what I need to do to get to the other side of the valley. Very good. Thanks for sharing those thoughts there. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question. Look for a raised hand or someone to come off of mute or put it in the chat box. I don't see one yet, so I'll go ahead and ask one. So when there's anyone looking at this industry, a common concern is that there's so many sign companies, whether it's other sign world owners or just other sign companies. And y'all kind of mentioned that early, but how'd you get past that? How'd you get past that concern or fear that, how am I gonna find customers when there's so many other sign companies competing for those customers today? Uh, Larry, let's start with you. Well, we've got, uh, I, haven't, I haven't looked recently, but I, I did many years ago and we had, 200 plus sign companies in a 20 mile radius. Um, and uh, as far as sign worlds, we have about 10 in this area. And I never, if, I, I say never, I don't ever know if I'm going up against another sign world. Um, first of all, I don't talk about who I'm going to see. They don't tell me who they're going to see. Um, but competition is not is a big deal. It really isn't. And I, I'm a little bit ashamed to say that because in retail, that's all you worry about is, mm -hmm. is competition. But in this industry, it's about taking your customers, taking care of your customers, and treating them so that they become that repeat customer. And once you do that, once they, you've earned their trust, you're their sign company. So you're not looking to build and build and get uh, 1,000, 2,000 customers you you just want those few customers that have that appetite for signage. Very good, Larry. Thank you. Kelly, you mentioned about five other owners in the Metro Milwaukee market. Uh, there's probably a lot more sign companies. What were your thoughts? Yeah. No, there are. And, you know, I, I did obsess over it when I started. You know, I, I spent, you know, nine months trying to figure out the industry and you know, being an engineer overanalyzing it, of course. But, um, yeah, and to, to the truth of the matter is, though, I the sign roll people, you know, those those people are competitive you know i don't see them a lot i rarely see them um but they're competitive we know they are because it's a good program but some of the franchises there's a lot of those fast signs and sign aromas around us as well but you know we 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 see them we we actually you know sometimes people will even share quotes with them and and, and part of the you know the price miles i know they're trying they have you know franchise fees that they've got to somehow factor into their pricing models to make sure that they're covering for that um, so you see those and you kind of look at them and you go, oh, we're, we're in a really good shape. We knew what our numbers needed to be when we started. We knew what our trajectory was and we've exceeded at our, our revenue and our, and our margins. And, um, it's, it's not an issue. I don't, don't run into them. I know, I know they're there. I mean, they have to be there. People get multiple quotes, but uh, you know, you know, kind of as Larry said, I don't, I, I just don't really, I don't really notice it. It's, I just don't even pay attention to it, to be honest with you. Unless I need help from one of the sign roll guys around here. I don't talk to any other sign companies, really. Okay. Vic, you mentioned about 400 sign companies in Dallas, I believe. What do you think led to you being so successful with 400 other companies around you? Yeah, I think it, Larry, Larry hit the nail on the head. I, I never really worried about the competition. And it was really more controlling the things that I could control. And that was taking care of the customer. That's the one thing I knew I could do is is, you know, respond quickly, you know, listen attentively, you know, help them solve their problems and, you know, be and earn, earn that respect from those customers. And I think anybody that does that has the ability to, you know, have success in this, um, in this type of uh, environment, because there's, there's so many signs of opportunities out there. It's way more than the number of sign companies that can fulfill them. Uh, in, in my opinion. So uh, 
Um, and I think there was one uh, to just address one other question, something about you know the profitability in year one compared to years two, three, four, things like that. Um, I think most businesses it takes a while to to you know get back to break even. Um, but I think the opportunity long term, because you have a asset and a you're building something uh, in a you know certain size company and it's a manufacturing light manufacturing type of business, ultimately the return on investment long term is going to be greater, even though it might be smaller initially, but it'd be greater long term. Um, with uh, this type of business. So I know somebody had asked a question in the, in the chat that we didn't get a chance to answer. I have another call I have to jump off to. I'm gonna sign off. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you everybody. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thanks, Dick. Jack, in closing, any other comment about competition? Otherwise we can wrap it up. Just one real quick on the competition. 90% of the sign companies out there are not a non-franchise independently owned. While a few have good process procedures, most are owned by an independent individual who was a sign maker, who is very good at making signs, but is very single task focused. They don't show up for the appointment. They don't deliver the quote as promised. They don't deliver the project on time on budget. We're doing the opposite. We're bringing in corporate executives that understand customer interface, understand managing schedules, juggling multiple projects, working on the business, not in the business, having software to put, to, put together the quote, having software to manage the project. We become the anomaly. Absolutely, very good. All right, everyone. Well, we are just a few minutes past the hour, so we're going to go ahead and close our session today. First off, uh, Larry, Kelly, and Dick, who had to depart early, as well as Jack, thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedules to share your thoughts and perspectives. To our participants who joined us, thanks for your interest in wanting to learn more about Sign World and our business model. Our team looks forward to the continued conversations to help you and better understand more about us and decide if this is the right fit for you in this next chapter in your lives. And to everyone, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you.